you won the SoCal Grow Off last year, and where did the genetics come from? That was from Dark Heart Nursery. I think it was the grapefruit Romulan, and then that was the one. But but you didn't know it at the time. No, no. I mean, everybody had their ideas, but we were way off. <laughs> and how many clones do you get? We get two. It, yeah. it was funny because when we got there, we didn't have the money order. So to find the money order, we went on a mission walking for blocks to find a place. So by the time we got there, it was it was it was funny because I would saw Heavy T or Tyler at the time. And uh, this is just before we started doing the, the podcast, and uh, it was always fun for me. I think that whole contest was really for me to, to see what I could do against him in my mind. So it was, it was a fun little aspect to that, <laughs> just seeing him pop up randomly. You get two clones, and you bring them back, and not knowing what it is, how does that affect you in terms of a growth? It's just like being a chef, I, I would consider it. It's like... Um, I like to cook, and I think that a lot of good chefs out there, you can give them a different stove top, you can give them a different pan, and they know enough to where, like, looking at how it's searing, looking at how it's cooking, they already know when it's close to done just by feeling it. And, you know, to me, you know, part of being a good grower is experience. So over the years, it's knowing little things like that, is knowing the plant structure as it grows, I knew immediately it wasn't a very stretchy plant, we'll call it. Um, it was definitely a, a long veg, but in that long veg, I think with you know different varieties of strains, they would grow a, a lot more lankier in that time period, which was a nice thing that it stayed so squat because for me at the beginning, I thought the whole contest was based on who can grow the biggest plant, you know, and, and for me it was just, I think everybody's mindset in the, in I don't know, since like 2010 yield, you know, everybody, it was a big thing to hit two pounds a light. And then people were hitting three pounds a light, you know, and it was a big thing for people. So for me, it was like, okay, um, I started out growing big plants originally because when I would have a personal grow, you know, to be perfectly legal, it was six plants in California. So I was like, okay, well, six plants, one plant per light, I got six lights, here we go. You know, most people are thinking, oh, I'll put six plants under one light. It, it, then it became, okay, so we're able to, to grow. And, and for me, everybody learns from somebody. I'm not going to say the guy's name because he was a real, I call him old man hickory, but he was a family dude. You would have never thought this guy grew pot. And um, I remember walking into his garden for the first time and it felt like a scene on a Jurassic Park, like... I've been growing for a long point to that time and to see somebody growing these monster plants that were just kind of trellised out and just these huge colas, I was just, it blew my mind. And, um, you know, I think when I saw that, I was like, oh, this makes sense. And we started to grow any genetic one plant per light and just knowing the veg times of them and how to manipulate the plant that we just needed to fill that four by four square under that thousand watt and, and we knew that we were going to get at least a pound and a half to two plus pounds off this one plant and you know between two people we could have 12 plants you know and um it was kind of a loophole for us in a sense you know most people like for me sometimes like people smoke i think chain smoke cigarettes it's not that i chain smoke but i love to smoke just the act of it so if I'm medicating, I think that, you know, unless I grew enough, it, it wouldn't have been worth it to me to just grow one light and six plants. After seeing this, it just blew my mind. And when I saw the contest, I was like, okay, I've been doing this forever. This, this is going to be easy. So, you know, I think that everybody was so focused on the quality and, 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 and the, the potency and these other aspects is... It, it, when it came down to the results, because we yielded so much more than even the second place competitor. I think maybe they got a half a pound, and we got almost four pounds off this one plant, which it was cool to see the Colorado contest kind of step it up. I saw uh, even before this contest, a lot of people were really focusing on getting these huge yields off one plant. And um, I think it's really cool that, you know, 
for me, most people have always said, oh, don't grow a big plant because it wouldn't be as potent as a plant that's smaller. And there's philosophies where people would say, well, growing a smaller, more compact plant takes that plant's energy and, and, and puts all of this into one smaller bud, meaning it may be more potent, hearsay. And um, I know that we stretched it right to the deadline when we, when we, uh, we turned it in. I think um, even the product we turned in was, it was unflushed because <laughs> it was, I, I, I think it still needed at least about another seven to 10 days before we pulled the plant. But because of the deadline with SC Labs and the, the laws, everybody's hands were tied. We had to do it by the 31st. So, you know, still being able to get third place in potency and fourth place in the terpenes, it was huge to me because I know we didn't finish the plant how we wanted to, but the, the yield was just, what, over three pounds over even second place. I was like, that to me spoke a lot because you got situations like, um, you know, I, I, I talk with people that are in Michigan and having a large, full, mature plant count stipulation where you don't see that the same in other states. Well, being able to grow larger plants is a huge advantage for people like that because then you're actually increasing the amount they're able to produce as well. Um, so, you know, it was, a, it was a cool way to, I guess, show, showcase something that I've been doing for a long time. And... Uh, you know, I've, I've been the guy that worked behind the counter in the hydro store, and you're always giving people advice. And uh, I was always that crazy guy that would grow one plant per light, and, you know, and they'd be like, no, show them a picture of it, Jerome, show them a picture. And I would show people pictures, and they'd just blow their mind that you can do this. So, you know, I think a lot of, you know, what people don't believe is possible is because they've never seen it. And I think the more this competition actually grows, they're going to be able to actually bring people in there with cameras and, and really go into detail about their growing practices. And let's be honest, some people aren't going to give away all their secrets. Um, you know, for me, growing at least cannabis has always been about for what I could do for my sister who, who passed away from cancer. You know, at the time we had dispensaries, but it wasn't tested and it wasn't as strict, and you knew that there was harsh chemicals, and there was things that we didn't even know to this day that were happening that we could have prevented for people to get the cleanest medicine. And for me to do that was to grow it for her. And she wasn't a smoker. Uh, Basically, so you know exactly what's in it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that it's the peace of mind. And not many people get that experience. You, you get something, we'll call it stepped on. You never have the opportunity to get quality medicine right from the grower themselves, right to you. It's very rare for people to have that experience because even in today's date, you have a product that's being produced at a legal, you know, clean facility. Then that product's then being sent for testing. And by the time it's packaged, it's been touched and, and, and moved so many times that you lose kind of to me, that visual aspect of quality that you get when you, you actually get it right from the source. It's just like anything that's fresh. There's, there's a slight and subtle difference that only the people that would know will know. And that's the thing that people need to be educated about. And for me, to grow clean cannabis, uh, you know, I've always wanted to do as clean as possible. And it always didn't make sense to, well, we have an indoor grow, but we're going to take outdoor elements like cocoa, or soil and bring them indoors. To me, that wasn't necessarily a, the most sterile thing that I could do. As far as a common sense factor to me is, I wouldn't take something that necessarily is, for instance, cocoa core, they, they let it sit out doors, it gets heated, they turn it, you know, it doesn't matter, it's shipped around. These are things that are not necessarily isolated to know that that was probably in a processing facility where they have rats running around the floor, and to me, rock wool, because it's spun at such a high heat level, I think they say it's at 700 some odd degrees, you have a very sterile substrate to me that comes from an organic source being it's, it's spun rock, come down into like a, a cotton candy kind of substrate. So, so is that your preferred grow medium? I think so, just because of the sterility of it. Okay. It's, it, do, and, do we factor in ecological uh, and environmental uh, factors? I think... You know, with that, there's a lot of water consumption savings and in, in benefit to that because you're able to necessarily not use the abundance of water you would have in deep water culture 
undercurrent systems where they use an ample amount of water and at the end of the cycle or for that reservoir change, you have excess water that you're dumping down the drain. So when people hear drained away systems or feeding systems that waste water because there's actual runoff coming out of the bottom of the pot, you have to really think about how much water it took to saturate those plants, how much water you're actually wasting in, in versus you know, people use what 40 to 50 gallon reservoirs per four by eight table in old school days doing these flood and drain systems. When to me, that's it doesn't seem logical because they're topping that off through the week and then they're just dumping it down the drain. And that's a lot of wasted water and nutrients. And, you know, depending on how that's set up, different states have laws and stipulations about the chemicals that can go down the drain. Some of them have different type of um, systems that collect this runoff waste so it's not contaminating where we're dumping it for instance i believe and i could be wrong i believe california doesn't have a law on this so we kind of just dump it down um i believe the ocean um is where a lot of this goes <laughs> certainly, certainly here in la i think that's the ultimate outlet for everything you know we're, we're ultimately all trying to do the right thing you know at, at least you could always just hope that people are at the end of the day, you know, we want to have this plant broken down and isolate it into ways that we can actually save people's lives and and use it for a benefit, you know. And I, and I think that realistically, I would love to see cannabis get to the point where you pay for your health insurance, you pay a five to ten dollar copay for expensive medicine. If people didn't have to spend, let's say, two, three, four, five hundred plus dollars a week on their medication going to a dispensary and paying these taxes you know, and it was worked out that way, I think everybody would benefit from that. You know, for me, I've always been the person that knows how to do it in my, my head, at least the right way. And, you know, it's kind of cool to be able to answer people's questions. So I've always worked, you know, whether it's doing the podcasts and things and, and speaking at different events. Um, it's like, I almost wish I never had to work for anybody in particular. It's almost fun to just consult with different people because as much as they're learning from me, I'm learning from different situations. Can you kind of talk about your own evolution and things you've experimented with? You're doing kind of SoCal indoor, right? Is that kind of your main? I, I mean, I don't know if it's SoCal indoor. You know, I base everything on me. It's, it's all about common sense for me. And, and for me to optimize anything as far as plant growth, you don't have to be a scientist to realize the faster you can get a plant to go through the water and nutrients that are in the media itself more rapidly, the plant's going to grow just as fast. So the thing is, is it's always been a being able to grasp whatever system it is. The biggest thing, well, minus like obviously deep water culture and, and, and true hydroponic style systems where the roots are suspended in water, where you have to play the saturation game, whether it's in soil or cocoa or rock wool you're always looking at the drying time period and the wilting points of this plant and not letting those roots dry out too much to create a lockout. So there's good and bad stresses that you can give to the plant. And for me, common sense is obviously get them to drink as fast as possible, have the most root mass uh, as possible. Meaning for me, you know, you look at the different types of potting containers, whether it's a smart pot or an air pot, the whole philosophy for that is a root pruning pot. So the science is, is when the root tip makes contact with the air, it causes that to necessarily die off at that point and stop growing, but it also creates supplementary root systems that branch out, causing a much denser root system where you don't have the spiraling of the roots choking the plant out at a certain point. And you know, you can extend the longevity of the plant's life in a smaller container, which with irrigation, you know, you can obviously cut down on the amount of transplanting. I think that's a huge part of, you know, people using rock wool blocks. Once you transplant them from the clone stage, they're in the same <laughs> container till the time they die, essentially. Right. And so there's not that stress of going into a different environment for the roots, you know, and, th and there's a lot of benefits to that. You know, as far as the cleanliness to me and being able to clean a room after and the, the different types of uh, cleaning methods that go into a soil or cocoa room, you have a lot of different problems with drains clogging up, biofilm and sludge accumulating with a lot of different organics. Um, and I'm not saying I'm against organics, 
but you know there's benefits to it in a true sense of nature if you're collecting data and you're able to take a plant and take that plant and actually plant it let's say every square inch of the entire earth and collect the data don't return let it do its own thing we're going to see where this plant thrived the most collect the data there and try and recreate that in an indoor environment so with that plants will be able to create their own food whether it's environmental or it's the plants themselves being able to break down the the foliage or whatever type of forms of compost that are there naturally and what's occurring there in the soil is meaning those beneficial microorganisms that we create teas and additives to try and simulate but some of them are actually beneficial and you take those that are in nature and you try and create a tea to brew those specific species of fungi and bacteria. Well, all these things are just basically chelating nutrients to the plant. I believe in it in any type of environment, whether it's hydroponic or not. A plant having its own sugar production, you know, from its roots, we have cellulase that needs to be broken down by cellulose. So, or I'm sorry, cellulose that's broken down by cellulase. And that's the plant creating its own sugars to feed those beneficial organisms with its own uh, form of carbohydrates. We have different types of additives we can add to feed these, which help them colonize at a much faster rate, assuming that the higher colonization rates of these microorganisms were able to benefit the plant by feeding it faster. It's, it's my way of saying, imagine having a milkshake that's really hard to, to suck up the nutrients with a straw and then giving your plant a bigger straw. And, and with that, in turn, you're optimizing all the other elements, whether it's temperature, humidity, lighting, and all these things go into the, the benefit of the rapid growth that you see. And, um, you know, that's why when people are so stuck in one way, it, it's, it's a terrible thing to see because I think I can get better every day. And the thing is, is if you aren't that person searching out these different aspects, like for me, seven eight years ago telling people about led technology and they're just kind of like rolling their eyes i've been using that technology for years especially in like a vegetative state it was always a, a difficult finding the right way to do it in flower and i never had the success that we have now but as people are switching over to led we see the benefits with that with electrical consumption we see um substantial benefits for different um uh, for instance, like we have DWP here in LA and Southern California Edison and different states have their different power sources, but they're creating different rebate programs that if we're consuming so much energy with a thousand watt amp, you know, or a thousand watt ballast, and we design that for HIDs and switching to LEDs, they're giving these people huge benefits as far as rebates to pay for these lights. So it's helping the owners and, you know, we get into people that have been doing this for years that were brands that that you know have been struggling to stay afloat with all the loopholes like you know for instance different cities have stipulations I, I see all the time where they're asking these 20 light rooms all of a sudden to to shut down because they don't have a co2 monitor that can only be installed by the contractors from the city and it's twenty eight thousand dollars per room how do you tell somebody that's already struggling at that point to come up with this money and it's a sad thing to see but at the same time, it's going to evolve to a point where I'd like to see all these companies survive. But at the end of the day, unless that company is putting the money into the technology to research exactly what we need in the plant, we need to figure that out. Because now we're just now integrating uh, lighting systems with infrared and, and ultraviolet light, which to me was a no brainer. Back in the day, we get to the last couple weeks of a cycle, we were putting in 10,000 K UV bulbs and getting this spike. And to me, it's like plants naturally have defense mechanisms and people know as resin to be one of them. And different resins, for instance, like especially a lot of people that grow, there's certain strains that I, I just have a negative reaction to around, like I get itchy or my, my skin gets red or irritated. And you can only accommodate that to what's in the plant naturally. And as they have these resin glands, we have to think not only do they get us high or medicate us, but they deter things that they would sustain in nature where they originated from. So to me, we get burned, our skin, from ultraviolet light. A plant creates more resin content towards the end of its cycle, especially when it's developing the resin when finishing by creating its own sunscreen, protecting itself from ultraviolet light. So it's a no-brainer to me. 
And, you know, I think the further we actually bring in real gardening practices, a lot of people always call them strawberries or tomatoes walking into a hydroponics store trying to get advice from somebody that was growing in their closet or whatever it may be. And, um, you know, whether it's a dosatron system, which is what from car wash industry and agricultural industry, and we're just like, oh, this is the next greatest thing. This is things that have been around. And, you know, it's the big gold rush for a lot of companies to create the next gimmick. But all these things have already been implemented into large systems already, whether from greenhouse or large scale farming. So, you know, we're going to we're going to see I would at least hope all the hype kind of stop at some point and then. Well, so, so you mentioned LEDs. So you're growing with LEDs and you've grown with them for a long time. And mm-hmm. you said you're flowering with them too or, or you right now we're converting a lot them? of them to to the flower um we've been doing a lot of experiments with a company um called ProGrowTech, and they've been doing custom lighting for us that we're gonna basically take to um a cannabis project i'll speak a little bit but it, of uh we'll be developing the second research facility at the university of uh, gainesville florida to to research cannabis and um we're Fe- working federally with them. uh or licensed research facility yes okay and where's the first uh, the first one's in mississippi yep okay so this will be literally <laughs> this will be and, a and, little and bit high, high tech weed. <laughs> yeah it's it's gonna be a lot different right you know we put a lot of thought in this and you know for me to to meet some of the the scientists that are involved with it um actually it was just past mj bizcon I, I actually was introduced to some of the people involved with a company called medicinal genomics yeah and uh, um, yeah, I, I sat down in a, uh, a meeting with Brian McKernan and, and a few other guys there from the uh, the company, and um, it was uh, it was almost a match made in heaven, I, I guess. Uh, I didn't know till about twelve hours later when I got called back for another meeting, and um, it's it's really cool to be a part of something like that. I think it's uh, it's really a dream of mine because for me. I've always wanted to be the best at whatever I do. That's why I love golf. It's, you know, I always tell my nieces, it's like, look, if you don't like sports, but you want to get involved in something, golf's a great thing. Because if you're good at it, you can get paid to take a vacation and get paid every week. And uh, it's you against the field. It's you. And everything that you do, you can't take away from you that you accomplish. And, you know, being able to grow a superior product or you know, something that makes somebody feel better, even if you don't hear it, that's a great feeling, yeah. you know, it really is. Let, let's say for the grow off specifically, kind of what was your setup? So it seems like LED lights, like what, what like are you using BIOS? Are you using... Uh... Well, we used uh, an LED. So let me explain the process for me. Um, I started out the first half of flower meaning the first four weeks for me, I just called it a nine week cycle, just in case. I think we really should have ran that plan about 10, 10 and a half weeks. But um, for instance, the first four weeks, especially having a higher orange red level of light with an HID HPS, like a Gabita light, for me, I took advantage of getting this plant to stretch out and cover a massive area. So, you know, getting those reds in there was huge. And that's why, you know, at the time I used a black dog LED for the second half of flowers specifically because it being a full spectrum light incorporating the ultraviolet in there as well was great to finish the plant especially to bring up resin production after i already got the plant to stretch and that was the plan um i think that you know that's why with the progro tech one of the things that drew me to the company immediately is the full capability of tuning the spectrum meaning i can go ahead and take the the red levels and and tune it down by you know a five ten percent ratio the white blue levels and them being able to custom integrate infrared and ultraviolet light into this as well, I think that what people are gonna see, what I've always noticed with LEDs, especially for veg, it was nice because we were able to double stack by controlling the height level of the plants, and I think that really came down to the frequency of the lighting itself. Um, Jair was one of the guys that brought the, the Gavita to life to market years ago when nobody was using double-ended lights. And one of the first times I had met him, he was showing me the light. I was like, oh, what is this thing? And after he explained it to me, what I took from that was 
we needed to increase the frequency of the light. For people that have been growing a long time, we started with magnetic ballast. There were these huge white boxes that would hum and get hot. Uh, not many people today that are growing will probably even know what this is, but they operated at such a low frequency that if you took a picture of your grow back in the day, you'd see these little wavy lines. And you can never get a great shot. I don't care who you are, you never had a great shot of your garden without getting these uh, little wavy lines, even if you took a video. And um, what we noticed, I compared this to like, for instance, we all had flat screen TVs 10 years ago. What's changed besides the, the 1080i you know, picture? It's always been the same. It was the, the hertz level or the frequency of the lights blinking themselves. For instance, um, the first TVs operated at like 60 hertz. So what I took from that is, is if you watched high definition, fast paced motion action like sports, it would pixelate and you'd see this ghosting effect. And as that increased to 120, 240 and beyond, you took that away. And what this does as far as the frequency of light for a plant is that is measuring the times that that light blinks for every one second. And operating at such a low frequency, let's say even if it's 240 hertz, we're looking at something going to 100,000 plus hertz when we're going into like the type of technology that Gavita brought in. And now that we're looking with LEDs, you're operating at such a high frequency that you're optimizing the amount of light that the plant's actually getting every one second and people don't realize those little things like that made a huge difference. And when you bring up the frequency and you can actually manipulate the actual spectrums of light, you can manipulate the type of growth you get from the plant. Meaning, whether it's tighter internodal spacing, a more compact plant, or even being able to take a plant that wouldn't be so compact and would stretch typically, and being able to slow down the vertical height of that by manipulating the spectrums. So, so with some of those scenarios can you talk about how you're dialing to make to achieve specific effects well and everybody's got to work within their limitations your, your space is your space so whether you have a four by four tent a four by eight table or a row you're you're always at the limit of your space and knowing the amount of veg time needed and to accommodating for me what i like about See, when I say rock wool, I use a loose rock wool, and it's hard to really explain to people sometimes because uh, Grodan themselves has made very different types of rock wool over the years. There was something that they used to make that was granular absorbent, granular repellent, uh, now also known as grow wool. Uh, they make like a cube style and a, and a chunk, which is probably about 60% bigger than the actual cubes, which will compare to like a crouton. Um, being able to know how to stuff these in the pot, the density at which they're put in there, and knowing the plant's drinking habits are huge. And that comes into experience when, when you know certain plants have a slower veg time, meaning they may just take a longer time to grow to the size you need them to fill a canopy with a certain amount of plants, or the amount of times it drinks, you could really put together a room with multiple different genetics and customize the media so that this way it dries out whether it's just evaporation of, of natural moisture into the, the atmosphere itself or the plant absorbing that moisture through the root system we want them all ultimately to dry out at the same time and being able to optimize the amount of times you get them to drink you can take a plant that doesn't necessarily drink as fast and manipulate the way that that potting media is put together maybe it's a lighter mix where it repels more water from being held on just naturally for a longer period of time and it will dry out at the same time as a pot mixed with maybe a, a more absorbent style uh, concoction, we'll call it, of uh, the, the loose media. <laughs> so you have your little rock wall cube. What, what's the rest of the grow media that is surrounding it for you and what size pots do you like? And... I've really liked the air pots, specifically for me, We'll go back to common sense. There's a lot of root pruning pots, but to me it's the only pot out there that actually raises the surface level of the plant itself approximately two to three inches off the ground, which is benefit for a lot of people. Some people are still in old school saucer systems, we'll call it, where you have runoff that the plant will sit in. And when you have a pot, old school plastic container, the roots are exposed sitting into this stagnant water, we'll call it. You're in a root pruning pot like an air pot or a sack pot. It's still wicking this moisture back into the pot, but it's sitting in stagnant water. Right. Um, 
it was a great thing for me. I was like, well, there's multiple benefits. Obviously, if you're in that type of a system, it's not sitting in stagnant water. You see rockable systems, even with cubes now. There's a lot of promotion of these little screen um, uh, inserts that you put into the tables. To me, it's just another headache to clean later, where it's giving the roots more air because it's raising them off the surface of the tray, which this pot does. So there's benefits like that. Um, just the amount of potting media that you use in comparison to a normal uh, setup where you're using cocoa or soil, it's, it's just a lot easier for me. It's a lot cleaner. You don't have so much sediment building up into the tables causing different types of, of pathogens to occur later on down the line. But, but is your potting media 100% rock wool? Yes. Oh, okay. That, that's kind 100%. of what I was getting at. It's just a very okay. custom mix. It's hard okay. to explain people exactly how it's done and how to stuff it in there because it's one of those things when I when I actually train people to do this we do literally hands-on and you have to feel the density at which you put it in and how it's broken up and okay. how so, much it, it, it's it's a little bit more complicated than it sounds you were a hundred percent just in Rockwell so now I get that and then you're using, uh, and I'm blanking because there are a bunch of Air AirPods or smart pots? AirPods. AirPods. Okay, so you have Rockwell and then what size uh, containers are you using? Well, for that particular plant, uh, for the grow off, we did a 12 gallon AirPod. Uh, okay. I started in a one gallon AirPod. So, so you got four pounds of yield out of a 12 gallon AirPod. And, that, and then in the past, I've always used sevens and tens. Yeah. Uh, we went a little bit bigger. Um, I think... Uh, but it's not huge. No, it's not a big no. time. Yeah. That's impressive. Okay. <laughs> and, and, and then in terms of the nutrients. So for me, I, I, I think of two things. One, is, I want to talk about kind of your nutrient mix and what nutrients you're using. But then also, we've touched on uh, sort of moisture levels. And for me, I think of like trying to keep the roots within a band of moisture. Correct. You know, so you don't want it to like get super soaked and then like it's dry finding the that, hell that out and then like teetering you don't want it before. to keep going like blow past the band and then come back into the band, blow past it the other direction. Um, so are you kind of a proponent of frequent small dose watering? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, micro dosing the water to yeah. keep an even saturation or a constant saturation where it's not sopping wet but it's not dry. And I think that perfect mixture allows for the right amount of airflow to get to the roots themselves as well. It, we, we cut off oxygen to the roots at a certain point by water logging them. Water can only sustain a certain amount of oxygen level for so long, and at certain temperatures it depletes rapidly. Even it'll fall out of solution when we're Let's just talk about the boiling point of water, right? At, at such a rapid rate, we're separating this. But at, let's say, a level of 66 to 68 degrees, we could actually scientifically put the most amount of oxygen within that water and, and deliver that to the plant if you're trying to be optimum, we'll call it. And then finding those small fluctuations of, well, the nutrient takes this long to mix. It takes this long before the feeding actually occurs the variance of the temperature goes up or down in, in a certain direction depending on different variables. Some people are in cold climates where they have cold flooring. Uh, some people don't have that issue. So, you know, everybody's grow is always going to be different. And I think, you know, there's no perfect way. In a, and, and I think a lot of grows are, are almost like a, an art because you, you get a canvas. It's not always the same. And depending on now how the city wants you to have whatever aisleway space and drinking fountains wherever and, you know, you design it based on that to optimize what you can do there. And it's always going to be different for everybody. It doesn't matter who, but you, you develop a good recipe to do that. And then what's kind of like your preferred, I mean, are, you're doing like drip irrigation. I mean, you're not hand watering the stuff, right? So Not on the commercial level. You right. So, so, so some of this stuff I want to start exploring more is, is like blue mat tensiometers. They're basically these little carrot looking tensiometers. And basically they, you, you can set it so you kind of have your moisture level you want to achieve. And if it's less moist, they'll release water or water plus nutrients and if it's you know once it gets to the optimal moisture level it'll stop so mm -hmm. like let, let's say i mean think of an uh 
let's say a greenhouse grow, right? Where you right. have one end of the greenhouse that's maybe a little more shady, the other end that's hot and sunny, yep. the air is blowing in one direction. So you're going to have kind of, if everything gets watered the same, you're, you're going to have, have fluctuations. You're, yeah, you're going to have, it's damp and moldy and mildewy over here. It's too dry over there. Whereas if you have kind of each little carrot steak, well, as and, long as companies make these affordable for, for right. larger operations, because we've seen a lot of that technology and, you know, it's not very cost effective when a lot of these systems are, you know, 10 plus thousand dollars for the monitoring equipment plus an extra thousand dollars per sensor. It doesn't make sense yeah. because to me, the raw materials obviously don't cost that much. So, so <laughs> on the irrigation front, on the, I guess, let's say commercial front and the personal growth front, like what do you... What do you like? What are you exploring? You know, every situation is different. If it was left up to me, you know, I, I love keeping my, my custom Rockwell mix. I like using the AirPods. Um, but, you know, it really is, is tailoring to, to the, the grows in specific. Like you said, some people are stuck on their ways. And for some people that are in ownership to have employees that their success is based on past experiences and being familiar with what they're doing, you're kind of at the risk. And I see a lot of people getting the runaround where everybody's a master grower today. They walk in and they're failing. Like I, I see it all the time, you know. Um, I was a master grower in a 10 foot by 10 foot square oh, space. And now I'm running a one acre greenhouse. And putting the owners in, you know, into debt and making them feel like they're not going to make it. And, uh, at the end of the day, it's 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 it doesn't matter what you do. It's about how to scale it and be successful. And you know, I think if people will, you, know, you can grow it any way you want. I think at the end of the day, it's what makes you comfortable. And for me, I can't always be there, so I can recommend the system for somebody. And unless they have the people that are competent enough to to see that out this way it needs to be done without any screw-ups we'll call it you have to put faith faith into systems that will be bulletproof we'll call it and you know whether that's just simple things like i had a conversation with people the other day about is it better that we go to powder nutrients versus liquid nutrients and there's advantages to both i said well you know let's ask ourselves well with the powder nutrients there's a couple of variables that could change Meaning, let's say the scale that you're using isn't properly calibrated and or it's reading a certain way, but you don't necessarily know if that was calibrated or in calibration correctly, which can cause your measurements to be off. Two, if you have somebody that's weighing it themselves, you have to look out the way it's you know being done. Meaning uh, a lot of people will necessarily, different products can't be in conjunction, meaning an A and B aren't in the same container because they need to be mixed separately. And when you take certain concentrations, when you're weighing out powders and you put an A in there and you have residue from the A still in the container and you have an employee that just fills it back up with B, you have to ask yourself, okay, how do we eliminate small issues like that? We go to a liquid fertilizer where it's very simple. We don't have to worry about the consistency being off or contamination of, of nutrients creating a lockout. Um, there's just little things like that is based on the help that you have and have hired. Um, you know, from my experience, it's always been best to find people that had n no knowledge of the grow industry whatsoever. You know, in fact, I call him a protege, but, you know, one of the, the best people I know in this industry, he came from Craigslist. He, he knew nothing about growing. His, his, he, his family was you know, not from the United States and barely spoke English and hated that he smelled like weed coming home every day and, you know, from working in the garden. And, and the guy now can, you know, build an irrigation system for you and do all these cool things. And it wasn't because he was arguing. He sees a common sense factor, I call it. I don't care how you do it, but every situation is going to be a little bit different. Um, you know, and, and, and the thing is, is when you have people that always know what they're doing, they go into these situations based on prior knowledge. There's a lot of science behind this, whether it's the water pressure delivering the, the water to the emitters, the, 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 the amount of flow rate the emitters are, the, the actual things that are actually dividing this water out, meaning it's an octobubbler or whatever type of system you have, calculating the amount of water and how much pressure and 
you know, just even the, the PVC pipe size, all these things matter. And, you know, this is no different from any other industry that's been doing agricultural. It's just now that people are seeing it is less taboo. I think you're getting the people that are real professionals getting involved. And, you know, it, it's going to put some people out of jobs if they don't get out of their mindset of their way is, is the best. You have to open your mind. When you were doing the two plants for the grow off, did you just bolt them on as two additional plants of a commercial operation or was this like at home or? No, this is a commercial operation. Okay. And, and so, so you basically like, you know, your, your commercial irrigation system, you just added one for each of those two pots and. I originally only planned for a four by four section for the plant. Okay. Just because I didn't see it using very much more than that. Um, and even with that four by four section, technically we had about 50 inches almost in, in each direction for it. And, you know, for instance, uh, the plant wasn't a very stretching plant whatsoever. So even by the end of week three, I think I have a video I could send to you where we took the tape measure out and it was already about 52 inches in diameter in all directions, only three weeks into bloom. So, you know, it covered quite a bit of space, but you know, I, I think that going back into this and, and, you know, once we do a competition that involves more of the uh, commercial operations again, it'd be nice to, you know, I, I already have some plans for it, but, you know, I'd like to put, you know, a room together or maybe, you know, maybe we put like four to four to eight plants over one light and, and really make a spectacle out of it and see right. if we can get, you know, 10, 20 pounds off a plant. Or, right. You know. <laughs> So, so, all right, so, so that, then those two plants were also on the same nutrient regimen as all the other plants in the room. What... Well, I didn't grow them both out. I, I killed the, the second plant through the veg because halfway through the veg, I already knew which one we tagged was the all-star. So okay. once we tagged them, I didn't need the other plant anyways. Right. So you were talking about liquid nutrients, dry nutrients. What, what are you using for nutrients? Are you making a home blend? Uh -oh. Are you uh... buying from a... A leading manufacturer. Well, I've, I've, I've been very fond of Mills Nutrients for a while. And it really started back in the day where my philosophy was is you're changing the additives to manipulate the growth throughout the stages and seeing, you know, working in the hydroponic business, I see it all the time. They have a veg and they have a bloom. Why? And for me, I was like, well, they have an A and B that works for veg and bloom. And you're just actually changing the stimulants based on the plant's needs throughout its cycle, which really makes sense to me. And, you know, knowing the secrets of the industry, it's like a lot of products aren't necessarily just developed from scratch. They're just rebottled. It's another large ag product that's rebottled and packaged and sold to you for 300% more. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. good because old... you worked in a hydro store, right? Oh, I know yeah. all the secrets. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the sad <laughs> thing is, you know, knowing all that too, it's, it's no different from any other industry, really. You know, if people didn't really pay attention so much to the marketing and hype of certain items and really looked into the actual products, they'd see that this is really no different. Um, it's for instance, uh, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the DuPont family and stuff like that owns several different entities of products. All these different companies that are large manufacturers own so many different products that we would never realize it's all the same company. Right. So if you're against one, you should be against them all. You know, it, everything gets like that when you perfect it. Somebody perfected a nutrient to the point where they could sell it to large scale farmers. My hat's off to them because if they're sitting there buying liquid fertilizer at our prices in this industry, <laughs> we wouldn't see farmers using any of that stuff whatsoever. And, and is there anything else you're adding in at various stages of the life cycle? I do a, a, a weekly tea regimen. Okay. I do my own teas. Um, I have my own IPM that I integrate into the, the plant cycle, whether it's just for... Pre preventative. Preventative. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talk about responses in the plant. And I don't want to give out too much information about what I use, but just, just to put it out there, there's something called systemic acquired reaction in a plant. And what this really is, is how do we tell the plant that it's under attack, just like a human body has its own immune and defense system, and everybody's is, is better. Some people have better tolerance to getting sick than others. Plants are the same. And the thing is, is how to trick your plant into doing what you need it to do throughout the cycle and how to manipulate those reactions out of the plant 
is 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 all part of you know trial and error really i think all plants will react differently and you know these are these are some secrets that i'll keep to myself but <laughs> <laughs> you know i've done a lot of uh we'll call it nerdy uh experiments i've i've done everything you you could think of by trying to simulate gravitational pull effects um in vibrations to root systems to um different types of frequencies of sound uh you know you name it different types of music we did room, rooms with rap music rooms with classical music we've <laughs> you know and, and did you notice a difference what what, what yeah. do your plants uh, like to jam out to me personally my favorite thing to use in the garden is a just old school radio am fm frequency type thing to me i feel like there has to be some kind of voodoo to the the frequency of the sound coming in through reception and the frequency of an old speaker being a little bit more higher pitched we'll call it than a lot of the the, the new age style speakers was there a study on like, like the sound of birds chirping in the morning i, uh, I haven't seen much of that what my my favorite studies were looking at tectonic plates and vibrational sound patterns and what they do to sand. Uh, you look up different university research and certain frequencies will make the sand develop certain patterns. And I think that really had something to do with opening up the plant's actual, we'll call it skin or its pores, whether that's to transpire or to being able to absorb more CO2 levels more effectively. These are all studies that, you know, I, I'm interested in, but, you know, I think that there's a lot to vibration and sound. Well, so first of all, with the teas, that means you're introducing sort of microbes and, okay, so you're not a, a just a pure sort of uh, synthetic, nutrient. clean, yeah, synthetic. Yeah. Um, and the, and so, the thing so, is, is synthetic nutrients, just so you know. People could say organically derived, synthetically derived, but to me, in all aspects, it's not about what we think, it's about what the plant could absorb most effectively. And I think in a medicinal quality standpoint, for me, how a calcium or magnesium is derived is pointless because I want to have the cleanest, most available source. It's kind of like the same uh, difference between calcium carbonate and calcium nitrate. Calcium carbonate is a much, uh, it needs to be broken down. It, it's, it's very slowly absorbed or readily available to the plant compared to a, a calcium nitrate, which is already chelated in a form that the plant can absorb immediately. So, you know, when it comes down to organic or not, to me, it doesn't matter. It's all about just raw minerals and nutrition, just like a human body. If we need certain types of nutrition or minerals to do whatever it is we're training ourselves to do at a, at a high or competitive level, which we're doing with plants in, in an aspect where we need to obviously maximize profitability for the people that keep things running. But at the same time, we want to create a substantially better product than anybody else. And in doing that, you know, you have to look at all those key factors. Right. Do you have different tea brewing strategies for different phases of growth? Like, do, are you more fungal dominant early? Or are you more bacterial dominant later? Uh, you know, as far as the teas, I think that it's a very simple tea is necessary for anybody, whether it's, and this is where it's going into like what I use. Um, I think there's a lot of products out there, just to put a few out there that, that are very similar. Um, products like Extreme Gardening has Mycos and Azos, and there's Great White, there's Life Powder, and a lot of these different inoculants have relatively the same agents in them. People need to realize that that powder you see is a carrier that's not necessarily what the plant's absorbing. It's a talc. It's a pharmaceutical grade talc that this biology can stick to so you can transport that into the water and suspend them. Um, like I said, I think that a lot of these beneficial microorganisms are a way for the plant to help them chelate and effectively uptake nutrients. I think that there is benefits for them as far as immunity and defense in them. But at the same time, when you get microbiology in an indoor system and, you know, everybody's system is different, you have a lot of problems with that. So running a clean irrigation system to me is a lot more beneficial on a large scale 
project versus going fully organic. With that, you just have a lot of problems on the down the line, you know, and a lot more maintenance issues. Um, for me, it's about how to use those teas. I think that using them in accordance to where you are in the plant cycle, meaning a weekly cycle, we typically increase our food regimens as we increase the amount of time the plant grows, whether it's from beginning of veg to end of veg, beginning of flower to end of flower. And by increasing those nutrient regimens, for me, you also have salt buildup. And the thing is, is we need to realize, obviously, as an accumulation of salt builds up, you're going to create a possibility for plants to lock out nutrients. So we need to flush out those excess minerals. By releasing these bonds, to me, teas, this is one thing I, I can guarantee you, the best time for, for me and anyone to apply them, in my opinion, would be when you're actually flushing your plant or leaching those out on a weekly basis. Because what better to have these beneficial microorganisms that are in there that could help chelate and break down these minerals that are accumulating and we're not having to add food at that point. So, you know, in a large scale agricultural project, you're going to have to, in my opinion, I always like to splash these on top of the plants and not running them through the irrigation. So we'll have somebody that goes through and literally hand feeds tea, you know, and we're talking about a microdose, so it's not. Are like we talking like foliar or into the rock wool? Into the into the rock wool itself, okay. absolutely. Um, you know, and, and being do, able do, to do you any foliar spraying. You know, as far as foliars, um, one one good tip I could say is depending on your situation, um, there's different technology that I've been able to incorporate now to cut down on some of the uses for different types of foliar sprays, whether it's to prevent different types of fungal or different pathogens from attaching themselves to the plant. So everybody's environment's gonna be a little bit different. I think a lot of people are getting more into the preventive aspect of knowing that your room may look clean, but you bringing in outside contaminants is huge. So having a, a good practice of making sure that you don't bring them into the grow in the first place is critical. Um, as far as, you know, with large scale grows, it's hard for people to, to say we're going to have these things hand sprayed a lot of these systems big systems are a beautiful thing they're so automated you have track systems with fogging machines that will literally spray whatever you need to spray when you need to spray it um, some people like for instance that actually manually apply these you know great ways to cut down uh, on the amount of, of application rates would be to atomize this or uh, you know use paint sprayers a lot of times and meaning you can have a little bit go a long way instead of going through five to ten gallons you may go through one to two gallons of foliar spray depending on what type of application you're applying it for but getting down to the, the application of foliars i like it throughout the veg cycle i try and not do it past maybe week three or four of the bloom cycle and even in that it, it really depends on the situation if you know you have strains that are finicky meaning that they are a little bit more prone to pathogens or mold then yeah you have to keep a, a, a regimen of, of different types of chemicals we'll call them whether it's uh, something organic like a um, I think Marone was one of the sponsors so they, they make products from Regalia, Grandivo, Venerate, all products that I use um, you know there's other great products out there that necessarily would kind of contradict that because Let's say you use something like a plant therapy that has alcohol, you know, and, and um, different types of uh, extracts in it and citric acid. You can't necessarily apply that to something that you put beneficial organisms with. Say you're spraying a fungal dominant tea, you're not going to spray plant therapy right after. <laughs> it's kind of pointless. <laughs> um, so it just depends Drunk on what microbes. you're going for. You know, and, and a lot of people, you know, with a lot of different ap applications, whether it's the type of uh, protection equipment, whether it's the respirators, the protective clothing, um, being able to simplify all those practices for people is, is, is one thing that everybody's getting better at. And um, I don't, it, it, there's no perfect way to do it. Everybody's situation's different. Um, and like I said, it also depends on the people you have that are actually doing the applications. Right. So getting back to the initial uh, grow off topic. So <clears throat> you 
basically you didn't, it, it was almost like an iron chef competition where like you ran out of time. Obviously I'm sure everybody felt the same way where it's like, Oh, if I could have just done that one last thing. Well, they did originally give us a date that was further out, but because of the law change, it was out of their control. So even though we properly planned our schedule to pull right. down on a certain date, it was out of our control at that right. point. What ultimately, I forget you said this earlier, but what ultimately was the strain? Uh, grapefruit Romulan. Okay. Describe what you saw at the, you know, as these, you know, buds started to develop or you, you, you kind of had a general sense of what it was. Well, I mean, I had my guesses. It was a sweet smelling plant. It Put it this way. It smelled a lot better growing than it, it smoked. I, I'm sad to say it, but... <laughs> I call it the boofy, kind of a boofy strain. It's, it's, it's nothing special about it. I think that there's a lot of strains out there that are nostalgic for very different attributes of it, whether it's the color, the smell, the taste, the high, the effects of it. And, you know, we can joke about it. There's strains like Blue Dream that people will be like, oh, get that out of here. But people loved it. You know, there's strains like Green Crack that people are like, what's that? Some people are like, oh, man, no more of that. People loved it. You know, I think strains like OG Kush. Now, <laughs> OG Kush, you can get any strain that's named something different and just by smoking, if it is really an OG Kush, it's going to taste very similar. And by putting all these different names on it has always been kind of a joke to me over the years that people do this because we've lost sense of what truly what it is. They're all kind of the same plant and, and now that people that are breeding and doing their own pheno hunts will realize is they all came from a seed they're all very different but they're similar and we get different types of attributes out of different phenotypes meaning the structure and the way that the calyxes grow the structure of the leaves and how they form the amount it yields the potency of the plant how tolerant it is to environmental conditions and or different types of attacks from mold or bugs um you know and being able to hone in and I think that's where your tissue culture is a great thing where we can not only clean up strains that people have damaged over the years by using toxic chemicals that in some cases that were out of our control. I make the comment people complain about equal 20, but they use spinosad. Spinosad was labeled organic, but it was a neurotoxin when in, in combustion to, to inhale. So that was organic. It was labeled organic. You can still buy it as organic. So when people say organic's healthier, sometimes I'm like, well... Is it mercury uh, organic? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's certain things that'll just kill you. <laughs> right. So th th you said this was a uh, purple punch? Yeah, that's a purple punch okay. right there. So talk to me about, um, I view cannabis in the same way I view music. There's the Katy Perry strains, which may be the most popular, okay. but popularity in my mind doesn't mean the best. Uh, and then there's like the Miles Davis of strains or the, you know, experiment like something that you like a lot that's not being played on every major la radio station so everybody's can you, different right so can you talk about just from what you're seeing snapshot in time 2019 uh what's becoming popular in the la market and then contrast that with just what are you personally into right now in terms of genetics and breed? Like, what's exciting you? Like, who's your I'm excited obscure right now. artist who's up oh. and coming versus the <laughs> the the purple punch or the blue dream or the? Well, I'm I'm just happy that people are over. Just there's still people that are diehard OG Kush fans, but forever it's like, oh, if it's not OG, I don't want it. And I see the times are kind of changing and where people like more exotic flavors and, and meaning there's so many good weeds now that people are finding what they like the best. And with that, you know, you go over to a friend's house and they have whatever strain it is and you have whatever strain it is and you've never tried this strain and now you like this strain. Before it was like, let's just put it this way, black market days, you go over to your you know, person's house to pick up a bag of weed or even at the dispensary, it was like 13 different types of OG Kush and like three others. And, you know, I think that now people are seeing better variety. I see that people are really into colorful strains and, and more of a kind of exotic smells or fruity smells. 
And I think that really goes to the point where they're all very similar in THC. I think until we really feel out full spectrum of what's in that plant that makes us feel the way that we do, that we like, that maybe somebody else doesn't, it's all about flavor for me at least. Yeah. You know, I'll smoke enough to get high. I don't care what yeah. strain it is. Well, it, it, yeah, and I and I view kind of where we are with cannabis right now is as alcohol came out of prohibition, kind of everyone was so focused during alcohol prohibition on highest proof. So you had kind of like your whiskeys and your bathtub gin and your grain alcohols and kind of like a, a fine craft wine sort of came later on, right? It wasn't like 1935 that... The well, there's US always was... those crafts, but you had to know the people. Right. You know? I'm thinking of the general public. Like for me, like you, like I could drink six glasses of wine and my goal is to get drunk. <laughs> I can appreciate each one. And what you're saying is, you know, your cannabis doesn't need to go up to 11 on the THC scale. You just smoke a little bit more and what you're more focused on, what I'm more focused on is kind of like the flavor, the terpenes, the kind of overall... The quality of the experience. Right. Yeah. And, and But I feel like there's still a lot of the market who is kind of THC driven. Like, you know, this one's 90 proof. <laughs> yeah, but it's um, like, do you want... And that's to say like, okay, all alcohol gets you drunk, right? At a certain point, but... To me, I've never really liked the taste of like people love whiskey and bourbon. And to me, it's like it burns when you drink that stuff. And to me, it's like, okay, if I'm chasing this effect, don't I want it to taste good and not be so harsh? So the thing is, is, well, we, we look at high concentrations of THC and concentrates, for instance. Some people don't like vape pens because it's real harsh. And I know for me, at least with vape cartridges, the more you smoke them, it's kind of like that old effect you would get from a vaporizer. You kind of get this cough, I feel like. Or you smoke dabs and it's 70 plus percent THC, but there's people out there that can just do dab after dab after dab, but they can't smoke three joints. Why is that? They've consumed so much more THC. So that already tells you that everybody is slightly different. What is that difference? That's what we need to really focus on. So what's your preferred, do you like rolling joints? Do you like? I like everything. Okay. I, 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 I got off the tobacco you're like, cake. You're like tapas, a little bit of everything. Well, you know, getting involved with different companies and just getting involved into the testing process. Like a lot of people don't realize, like I had an argument today with somebody, I was like, look, papers, blunts, hemp wraps, to me, the ultimate goal in life would be to smoke weed wrapped in weed, and it doesn't change the flavor. How, how do we do that? That's what we need to do because in a real, real health aspect, is it really healthy to smoke paper? Probably not, whether it's rice paper, hemp paper, any paper. How about kombucha paper, which uh, is now on the market? Well, the thing is, is all these things have a subtle taste difference, and it's like the same argument with people be like, oh, I only smoke with big lighters. Well, it's because you like the taste of the the lighter fluid if you change the light around them they could taste the difference what are you tasting you're not tasting the weed completely it's a it's almost like a mixology at that point you know even if you go into like a hemp wick you know it's like even hemp wicks have their own certain flavor profile and when you put them out you're smelling this kind of burnt smell in you know at the same time when you're trying to inhale your weed um so you know, finding out what, what really suits people, don't chase after the THC content because that's just like going to the bar and saying, I want the strongest thing you have on the menu. And that's all I want. I don't care because that's the effect I'm chasing and I don't care what it feels like to get there. I don't think, you know, when people are really getting approached in that, that way that they're going to say, yeah, give me the strongest thing now. Right. You know, realistically... If I gave you a glass of wine that was 12% alcohol and 14% alcohol and you drank six glasses of each, you're probably not going to see much of a difference. Right. <laughs> Who's a breeder who you respect? And, and what, what's some of the new genetics uh, that you're excited to play with? One of the people I'm going to mention, it takes me back to working behind the counter and seeing where they got today. Um, for instance, the, the Vault Seed Bank guys were longtime customer of ours through a company called Green Coast Hydroponics, where I originally met the, the owner of that company. And just seeing the, the evolving, you know, times for everybody and seeing what they've been able to do, 
it's really cool because the strains that they're able to create, um, you know, there's people that they have promoting these strains for them. Uh, people that I looked up to, like people like Be Real or um, everybody's heard the song I Got Five on it. And you got people <laughs> like the, the Yuck Mouth's Culotto strain or it, it, whether that's the strain for me or not, you know, I'll, I'll say it's not bad, but it's, it's some people are going to like it. Some people aren't just like any other weed. But I think that, you know, what they've been able to do to this point and seeing the, the whole kind of progression of it, it's almost like watching your kid grow up. You see somebody start at one level where you mention the word IPM to them and they're like, what the fuck is that? To seeing where they're at today, it, it's really cool to see people evolve. Um, you know, I know that a lot of people do a lot of marketing. Um, and at the end of the day, there's so many different strains that it's, it's really hard for you to say that one's better than the other. Because really, weed is different for everybody. And for me, I always have the strains that I like. In all aspects, I don't research a lot of the stuff that's nostalgic. For instance, you know, there's strains that I've had for years. I have no idea who made them. <laughs> I have no idea where they came from. I know how to grow them. Um, and what are some of those strains? Oh, man. Uh, see, one strain that I really like is uh, I have a cut of, of, I call it J1, but we've had this cut for, man, probably 2000 four or five something like that never really had a, a long-term mom of it. it's always been cloned of cloned and um this is something that we were given at a uh, orange county normal meeting at uh, a long time ago i got the privilege of meeting jack career and i mentioned that i love the strain so much somebody that was there with him gave me a plant of this uh years ago and um it was always a fun plant to grow i've always liked the taste of it um, it's one of those plants that just gets enormous buds too. So I don't know if anybody's ever grown it or gets the chance to grow one of those strains like a Jack or a J1, but you know, it has those huge pineapple buds like you get from the skunk. And, you know, for me before it was just OG Kush days, you know, there was a gray market aspect of things. And for me, it was like, well, I can get a pound and a half per light of OG Kush or... I can get three pounds of light of this. Right. There's a hundred dollar difference in the market. It's a no brainer, which way I'm going to go. So it was one of those strains that I just really started to grow, especially going after the one plant per light. And it was just easy for me. And, you know, I just fell in love with that strain in particular. And I think that, you know, going into a lot of strains today, I get a lot of that, like, it, it almost gives you that hint of kind of like where you get that tangy smell or there's certain aspects to the smell that I, I get different aromas from it all the time. It's, it's a fun plant to grow. And, um, you know, besides that, I think, um, I have a new strain that we developed. It, it was a cross of, uh, OG Kush and, uh, cookies and cream. I have no idea what we're going to call it, but we're waiting to see, Five more weeks and it'll be done. And uh, for the second time we ran it, just to see stability wise. But um, I'm excited about just being able to be a part of something like that. It was cool. We never uh, really knew what we were doing with the breeding thing. Um, we had a dispensary owner that had a bunch of male plants in his backyard and decided to do his own breeding. And uh, that was kind of the start of a lot of the different strains we developed. And um, one of the cultivations I worked with is no longer, so being able to hold on to those strains was kind of a nice thing, um, just because they're no longer cultivating themselves. That was actually the, the place that I originally did the grow off with. And um, since then, the, the cultivation has been turned into manufacturing and distribution. <laughs> the, the, the suits find it more profitable. Right. Um, but it is what it is, you know? Um, What's something that uh, you remember from 10, 15 years ago that you're like, oh, I wish I could find that again or recreate it? Or... I love smoking snowcap was a big one to me back in the day. It was a cool strain. It, it was just so fresh and kind of like 
peppermint. It was it was a unique smell. And where did it originate from, or what's the back? I think that was a, a Mendocino County strain, Humboldt strain. Okay. Um, I always loved Trainwreck. Was a big one back in the day. I loved the the kind of lemony uh, smell and taste. Um, man, there was another one when I was. Uh, really getting into growing around 2003 I want to say 2004 we called it juicy fruit and it smelled and tasted just like the, the the gum did it was it was incredible um there was all kinds of strains back then I remember one was like a squirt that was kind of a version of it I believe but it was just more citrusy um shit we used to do uh, the original skunk number one we did a lot of that uh white widow another old one um it was funny there there wasn't much to choose from back then it was like if people had seeds or if you knew the person with the cut um i remember paying five thousand dollars to have a cut of bubba kush just to grow the original bubba back in like 2004 we were growing bubba kush you know in 2003 the same person that gave me the bubba i had the og kush from and you know, that's kind of what the, the dominating strains were then. It was like the Bubba was huge for a long time. I actually love that strain. I don't see it ever. <laughs> and this was all, you're kind of like OC scene. Is that kind of where your sort of epicenter is? I mean, I came from Michigan to California. Um, I grew up, we'll call it high school days, more in like uh, Southern California, Garden Grove, Long Beach area. So you came to California in high school? Uh, like junior high, just okay. before junior high. Um, but it's so, like, but, but so, so cannabis wise for you growing up was SoCal. It wasn't yeah, Michigan. Yeah, hundred percent. It was, it was SoCal. Okay. So and, you're a SoCal boy. You know, right. we're, we're highly influenced in the area I was at by like the Cottonmouth Kings kind of, um, music scene. And a lot of the people that were connected into that grew up in that area. And not only that, like, um, just that whole scene back then was different. It was it was kind of like smoking weed in your car. We loved driving in traffic on the freeway for an exit or two because you can hot box it and not get in trouble. <laughs> um, it was different. Everybody has different experiences. For me, it was kind of nice because, you know, I was one of those people that always had a cigarette on me or a cigarette in my car because, you know, you can't smell like weed and go home. So I'd puff the thing and blow it in my shirt a bunch of times and blow it all over myself. And I remember uh, getting a bunch of messages and post-its in my room from my mom one day about like how I shouldn't smoke cigarettes, it's bad for <laughs> you. And right. these anti-cigarette ad tapes and pamphlets. And uh, I remember just like going to my drawer and I pulled out this film container with a fat nug in it. And I, just, I was like, mom, I'm not smoking cigarettes, I'm smoking this. And, uh, <laughs> and what was her reaction to that? I mean, she was happy, actually. Like, right. she'd rather me smoke pot than drink alcohol. It was more like, look, if you're going to be doing stupid stuff like that at this age, don't get in trouble. You know, don't let your dad see that you're smoking pot, obviously. Right. Um, but, you know, I think that was the, the start of having a good education about it for me is being open and having somebody you could be open with at that point of your life because, I mean, my, my parents, my mom, I just, her and her sister were groupie hippies, you know, went to Woodstock naked type shit. Um, so they, they were very understanding people when it comes to whether it's psychedelic type stuff or just pot in general, so. <laughs> All right, well, Jerome, the wife has returned home, so. We're done. We are done. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, no. so, so I'm gonna, you're, you're gonna be at the grow off. Uh, the 13th. The, uh, is it the 13th or the 14th? It's one of those two days. It's Saturday, whatever it is. I'll see you down in uh, in your home turf yeah. in like two weeks. Okay, that's where I live.